Well, thank you so much, Nisha, for joining me today. Very excited to chat about your incredible journey. Uh, I've, I've read some stuff and watched your TED Talk. I mean, it's it's really amazing what you've what you've done so far in your young life, and, and what you're going to do is <laughs> what you're going to do. You, you still got so much time left. You know, it's going to be incredible what you what you do from here. But before we get into you know you being CEO at Dream.org and why you took on you know this mission and and what that means for you. Talk about your journey up to this point. It, it's been incredible. You've done so much stuff. Uh, I guess start wherever you want. Just just from listening and reading, it, it sounds like you know your father kind of had a, a profound impact on setting you up for a life of of activism and common <laughs> ground and bipartisanship. Mm-hmm. All these things that we need to actually get things done. Uh, right. right. So I don't know if you if you want to take us back to to when you're growing up and maybe influence that your father's sure. story had on you. Yeah, absolutely. So one, thank you for having me on the show, but also thank you for calling me young. I love hearing it um, often these days as uh, as I approach, I'm approaching 50, I guess is the next mile marker. So I like still hearing that I'm young because I feel young. Another 50, yeah, you got another 50 left. Right, sure. Uh, so thanks for that. And um, I really, I have a hard time knowing exactly when to start my journey, but when I look back on it now, I think there's always been this trajectory. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia in the 80s, and my father was an immigrant from India. And back then in Atlanta, it was very much, and it still is to some extent, a very black or white town. Mm -hmm. There Mm -hmm. wasn't a lot of anything in between. And if there was anything in between, it was very, you know, it was very much in only certain locations. So Atlanta was divided and segregated, but people weren't used to seeing someone like me. And Mm -hmm. growing up, there was a lot of those questions. What are you? That still Hmm. exists today. What are you? And that's such a hard question to answer. And growing up and learning how to answer that question, not really fitting in anywhere, I think that I've always identified myself a little bit of a misfit. I'm neither here nor there. I'm neither black nor white. I'm neither from the old world, India, where my father immigrated from and not fully American, or at least that's how I Hmm. felt growing up. And that misfit identity, that not quite fitting in anywhere, it could be very isolationist if you let it. That's a choice. The choice I see seem to have made over and over again is to make that my superpower, to make that be how I'm a chameleon. And I learned to fit in anywhere. My father very much coming here and immigrating, he wanted that American dream. He really Hmm. believed that, you know, working hard and doing everything I could, he he could, he'd have a piece of it. And he did. He went to grad school in engineering and ended up working at an engineering firm and then starting his own engineering company in Georgia. And so my trajectory very much went from working class to owner class. My father had a very successful engineering business. I like to say he started outsourcing before it was a thing, but obviously he didn't actually outsource. It was just his best friend had the similar that he went to school with, engineering school throughout India. He had a manufacturing business in India. My dad Uh had the engineering business in Atlanta and they would manufacture it in India and ship it here and sell it. And it actually, I mean, it was outsourcing before it was common. And so, you know, I watched my whole income shift. And with that, you learn a lot of lessons. Being an outsider, you see what's happening. You get a perspective that I don't think you get when your views are reflected in the mainstream, when your experience is supposed to be the normal experience or what is seen as American, you don't quite get the same view. And I was always raised with that. And I know that it gave me a fierce sense of justice where my dad's goal in life was to make it and make you know mm-hmm. money, make it in America, make a better life for his children. I really, at a young age, found this passion towards justice. I don't want to exclude anybody. I don't want anyone to feel left out or left behind in the promise of America and and what is the American dream? And so from a young age, I was oppo- oppositional to my father. You know, as a young Indian kid and a young Indian woman, my job was really to um, look pretty and marry well. In mm. India, there's a very strong emphasis on marrying within your class specifically. Had I accepted that, it wasn't who I was. I wanted to do more. And so in India, you know, the path is engineer or doctor, and those did not speak to me. And I charted my own path. I really did want a world where my future wasn't determined by my birth. Being an Indian woman and, you know, learning how to make tea, that wasn't all that it was going to be for me. I wanted something else. And I wanted that for everybody. So I see that. I see that in my journey leading up to being a young activist. And my growth was really just, I was a super radical punk rock kid, chaining myself to buildings, getting arrested for many different causes, probably about a dozen arrests in my um, background. And 
just, I had to be outspoken if I was going to succeed in that. And I had to be successful in my, and yeah. in being outspoken. Spoken. And so I went to a liberal arts college and I studied international studies and women and gender studies and all of these things that were not even in the realm of my family's understanding. So I broke the mold and I want everyone to kind of break the mold, I guess, is, is where a lot of what I did and what I do comes from. So that's kind of a little bit about me. You asked about my father's experience and this was a big part of growing up too. He was born in India during the partition times. So when India got its independence back then, they just, England, when they were leaving, drew a line in mm -hmm. the middle of India and said, this is now going to be Pakistan and this is going to mm -hmm. be India. And that partition divided people. It not just had two different countries, it divided by religion. So Muslims and majority Muslim people would live in Pakistan and Hindu and the majority Hindu people would live in India. And that brought about a large scale, violent outpouring people on all sides uh, yeah. upset about whatever it was. And it led the largest mass mobile mass migration in human history, people that were on the wrong side of the border, either side, if you were Muslim on the India side, you were trying to get yourself to Pakistan and vice versa. Well, my family was Hindu on the other side of the border. And my dad was a really young child and they had to go into hiding before they could flee. And I was told the story from a really young age, just learning the history of India and where we came from. They always did try to connect that to my upbringing. And the part of the story that they always told me and my cousins was that, you know, one night when they were in hiding, military came or militias or just, you know, roaming people looking to kill Hindus or arrest Hindus or whatever it was. And they had to be silent in their place of hiding. And my father started crying. As this is how the story goes. My grandmother had to shake him. She was shaking him to try to get him mm. to stop. And my grandfather at that point had made a decision that if he didn't stop crying, he would have to sacrifice my father in order to save the whole family. And luckily, and I've it's very dramatic. And usually yeah. if, I, if I tell the whole thing, I get really choked up. But for sake of this podcast, I'll tell you the short version. He stopped crying, obviously. He's alive. He lived, I wow. lived. So I lived because of that. But the part of the story they didn't tell until I was later, and I don't know why I didn't connect the dots when I was younger, because this seems obvious now, is that it was a Muslim family hiding my Hindu mm. family. It had to be. And another part of the story that came out that had been passed down was that at one point when another group was searching the house, that Muslim family swore on the Quran that they were not hiding wow. any Hindus. And that is a huge deal. And I like to think of that moment as being such a big piece of my story, because to this day, the partition, we still have Muslim and Hindu fighting each other. With the rise of Hindu fundamentalism in India, it's becoming actually worse than it was during partition times in some parts. There is such a hatred that's just baked in to the India-Pakistan conflict. And yet my parents and so many people have this story of neighbors coming together to save mm. each other's lives, of people forgetting about all the things that have been taught to divide and instead choosing to be together and find each other and appreciate the shared humanity, regardless of religion or regardless of the side of the border. That that's also a part of our history. And that's the part of the history I like to say I come from. It's the part of the history I like to remind my parents who are still sometimes in that mentality. You needed that Muslim family to save your life. We have through some of the most difficult things imaginable where it is murder, where it is you are actually encouraged to hate your neighbor versus love your neighbor, that folks have made that other choice in harder times. We're now like we now deal with mean tweets or the media puts out a story right. and we think right. we can't talk to our neighbor anymore because they mm -hmm. voted differently than us. Right. I know that you can. There was a family that did so for mine and it's why I'm alive today. Wow. You had mentioned that, you know, you kind of took a different path as as a young Indian woman. You know, how was those initial conversations or, or maybe not even conversations you had with, with your family, you know, about taking a different path? You know, what was that difficult to have those conversations to have? Or did they kind of, you know, believe in your, in your mission and vision to support you as much as they can? You know, I think when you're merging cultures, there is a lot of conflict internally that anybody goes through. What's good that I want to bring from the old culture, from my home mm -hmm. culture? What's good about the new one? And I do believe that my father has had, and it's it, it, it's still there, like there definitely still is very strong gender roles that play a part sure. in who my 
family is. But I think when he learned who I was as I grew up, that I was actually very book smart, which is very important value in India. And so I got great grades and A's. I think that he had to understand some of the limiting beliefs from the old culture about what women could and couldn't do. So I think that when he understood I could be successful in this country, he really wanted to be, me to be successful. I'm sure he would have rather me have been an engineer and take over his business. But there was an encouragement that feminism, yeah. something that has strong roots in this country and is only just growing stronger in India, that's a really important value to fathers of daughters and sure. seeing how it could be. So I think there was some acceptance. I did not envy the first time he found out I was arrested. I was able to keep that somehow hidden from him <laughs> until, right, I mean, try to, I, I grew up yeah. hiding a lot of things from my parents, for sure. Like I wasn't allowed to wear V-neck t-shirts, but I still somehow made it out of the house with-, with What was the first arrest? My first arrest, I believe, was at the circus bit. I was an animal rights um, okay. okay. Animal rights activist. Really any cause that felt good, I was willing to put myself on the line yeah. for. I look back on it now and I'm like, I should have been a little bit smarter. But that one actually was important because we had trained. I was with six other activists and we had trained over and over again how to make it to the center ring of the Ringling, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus and chain our necks to each other with those U-locks from bikes. And then get rid of the keys, right? So we had them like under our shirts, if you can imagine like hiding under high collar shirts so we could get into the center ring, lock ourselves and lie down in like a circle. And the theory is they couldn't cut us out of those. We'd end the circus. And they were having like a meet and greet beforehand where we were like meeting. And when I was locked down there in the center ring of the circus, I had a crisis of confidence and a crisis of faith in the moment because I was looking around and I was thinking about all those children who had come out to the circus that night mm. and I had ruined their night. They might not be able to see the circus. And mm. did they understand the animal right. abuse? And was this really impactful? Was that going to actually move the needle on the circus? And we could debate that back and forth. Maybe it yeah. could, maybe it couldn't. But in that moment, I didn't feel right about that action I took. But I was already locked in. Like there's not, sure. nothing. Sure, you can't go back at that point, right? Yeah. And I'm like, you guys, what have we done? What have we done? And I remember having, while the big jaws of life from the fire department showed up to try to cut us wow. out of this thing, I remember talking to my fellow activist and thinking there's got to be a better way. Is this really mm. how we move the needle? Right. Anyway, I didn't end up ruining the kid's life. They brought a flatbed truck, lifted us all up onto the truck, brought us backstage <laughs> and then cut, cut us out. So the circus went on without Man, it. Could you imagine if they had a video of this? This That would have been unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. But this is, I think this is a, this is a really good place where I want to go because I think activism is, I think is so important, but I also think like, strategy in activism is also very, very important. I think there's a lot, there's a lot of emotion in activism. So passionate about certain things, we we tend to to do things that, like you said, don't necessarily move the needle. They might move our emotional needle, needle right? And fill that that void a little bit, but it doesn't move the needle in actually the real issue that, that we're, you're, acting, you're fighting for, right? I guess learning from, you know, those arrests, right? And, and learning from early doing those things that may not have moved the needle as much as you wanted them to, I guess, talk about the things you've learned about that do move the needle. Because I think that that is the most important part and the most important message out of all this is like, we're passionate about certain things and we want to get things done. But how do we do that, right? Yeah. How, how do we blend that activist sort of emotional mentality with, you know, a common ground mentality, right? A bipartisan mentality to really get things done. Because that that's the boring part is getting things done, right? And that's that, that doesn't, you know, make the viral videos, but that's the stuff that moves the needle. Yeah, I think that question is everything right now. And I want more than anything for anyone who listens to this, but anyone that talks to me is to really explore that question in detail, because I believe that social change, there is a very large ecosystem that has to be in place to move towards any change, to move towards progress. So I think all parts of the struggle are important. I think you need on the ground, really righteous activists, like I was when I was young, to force the issue sometimes, because a lot of folks don't want to listen. And sometimes that's the way to have the conversation. You need that, but it can't be divorced from all the other strategy. So I would love everyone to study that kind of spider web of how we need mm. each other, that we need people who are thinking at what happens if we win? What happens if we win? Who are the next people to then lead? Whether it's 
uh, win an election, right? And you have all the houses go your way. Do you know mm -hmm. what policies you're going to enact next? If you win the hearts and minds of a certain issue, like I think about, I think there are two instances that we missed an opportunity for huge transformation. I think when the pandemic hit mm -hmm. for the first few weeks, we were really united. Yeah. You had people banging their drums for frontline workers out the windows. You had, you know, you had next door, you know, which is usually not used to be nice to your neighbors. Next door, you have people yeah. saying, I'll buy groceries for anyone who needs toilet paper. They built a whole map to help take care of each other. There was a moment when we knew our essential workforce was a key piece to keeping us alive. And so there was this moment of interconnectedness and power and passion that could have completely transformed. And it, it just slowly mixed, missed the mark and got political. And that same summer, I do think there was major transformation in how people thought of police violence, because we were all trapped inside our homes when yeah. we saw that horrific video of George, George Floyd's murder. And there was a moment in time when you could have an entire shift of consciousness around understanding that. And I think it still was effective in that realm. But those things divorced from larger strategy only go so far. And so I like to think of we need those. We need those passionate, beautiful moments like coming together during the pandemic. And we need the outcry moments when you can capture everyone's mind and say, this is injustice. We need those. We also need the strategy of, okay, then what? Because mm -hmm. we didn't know what to do when all of a sudden the world was behind what we were calling essential workers who before had been yeah. completely ignored. Yeah. They were as disposable and who cares? We didn't have the people in place to say, well, what do we do with this? And so we need our whole ecosystem to really appreciate each other's roles. I think that the folks are thinking about the next thing and the future focused have to be appreciated by the frontline activists who are chanting and shutting things down and vice versa. And we have a lot of history and a lot of study of movements that have done just that. Me, I started off talking about the Indian independence movement. That was a huge leap forward in how we thought of nonviolent activism. Gandhi started civil disobedience in major, massive ways, just walking to the beach and making their own salt, which was highly illegal because you had to import from England, but they went mm -hmm. to the ocean and started making their own salt, big march. You had people beaten down and killed on this march towards the water. That changed the people who beat Indians down on that march, changed their minds mm -hmm. and thought, why am I doing this mm -hmm. over salt? And that shifted. India got its independence before so many other colonies because they were committed to not just that nonviolent action to push the conversation, but also to governance. How can we have a multiracial, multi-religious democracy that really valued India? They became isolationist, a socialist democracy and helped build that country. They had the whole thing, you know, obviously these don't work out perfectly, but sure. they had people planning each part of that. That's what we need. So I would like everyone to kind of respect the other sides and me uniquely growing up in all different sides of it. I think I can see it. I can see the value of all of that. But the purity politics of my way is the only way to make change. Mm -hmm. That is just as divisive as the stuff we're fighting. So hmm. that's why I like to talk about that ecosystem approach. Let's move on to dream.org and, you know, why you decided to take the role, become CEO. There's a lot of big, big mission and vision with the organization. I guess, talk about that mission, mission and vision and what's the overall ethos of, of Dream.org and we'll get into a lot of the details. Sure. I joined Dream.org about 10 years ago and my kids were young. When I had kids, I took a break from working. I was doing fundraising for nonprofits yeah. before they were born and I consulted on fundraising while they were born and I got really lonely. Mm -hmm. And being part of activism my whole life and knowing that I saw myself as a part of social change, consulting wasn't doing it for me. I wasn't feeling the challenge. I wasn't feeling a part of something bigger. And that bigger piece was really important because I had been doing a lot of stuff and none of it I felt was making a huge mark towards the world I wanted to see. So I wanted to play a bigger game and I was extremely lonely consulting. So I thought of organizations that were doing big things or people that were doing big things and made a list and said, I'll work at any of these places. I did a lot of that kind of soul searching. Nice. And a job description came across my desk for an organization. It was called Rebuild the Dream at that time, which was founded and started by Van Jones. And Van was somebody who was just an activist like me who, since I'd known him, ended up in the White House, ended up leaving the White House, ended up, <laughs> he was on CNN at that point. And I thought, I want to play a bigger game. 
So I applied for a fundraising job here and slowly started growing the organization. When I started, there were about five people in the organization. 10 wow. years ago, we now have about 75 people. Wow. And in 2019, uh, at the beginning of 2019, so I remember it was that Christmas right before 2019, <laughs> when Van decided I've built it. He's really great at building and starting things and moving on. He was ready to yeah. move on. And he asked me, will you be CEO? And my first response was no. Absolutely not. It's like the worst job in the world. It's like a principal, like a high school principal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything <laughs> that's, wrong, a great, that's a great analogy. <laughs> yeah. Everything wrong is your fault. You don't get paid mm. enough. Nothing right mm. is because of you, right? You give credit to everyone else because that's what a good CEO does. So I thought no, and he was like, fine. And he hung up. And I called some of my colleagues and coworkers and got some advice. And they're like, of course you should. If not you, do you really want to work for somebody else that's not that's, you? That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. And so I called back because I was really comfortable in the role I was. I was really good at the job. And to me, that is something I'm not ready for yet. I'm not ready to be comfortable and good where I am. So I knew that taking the CEO role would be a risk, especially with the founder leaving, who had done a lot of the fundraising and brand awareness. And it was a risk. It would be really outside my comfort zone. And I was fully aware that the whole thing might fail and crumble. But I took it. Why not? I jumped in in 2019. I had little Bambi legs trying to figure out how to make this thing grow. We were about 20 people at that point. 2019, I said, hey, it's all about management. We need to be better managed. We need to grow up our systems. We need to go from startup to like real organization. I knew what I was doing. Then one year, exactly one year later, January 2020, I have hmm. this big vision. All right, my, my legs are solid. I know how we're going to run. Let's do whatever I said I was going to do in January. I can't even sure. remember now because two or three months later, all of those plans were thrown out the window. And I had to learn how to lead when nobody had, mm. no one had a guide. No blueprint. No blueprint. Yeah. No, nothing. So that was 2020. And um, we actually grew our organization quite considerably during that year. It was our biggest fundraising year. It was our um, biggest growth year. And there was a lot of possibility. And that's, I mean, that was my second year as a CEO. So since wow. then, it's all a fog. I'm like, all right, 2020, <laughs> I got down. Um, 2021 and 22 is, you know, building on that and yeah. on that legacy. So it's been four years. For those who, yeah, for, for those who, who aren't aware of sort of the, the three pillars that yeah. sort of dreams sort of goes after, yeah. can you talk about green justice tech? Because I think those three are probably the thing that is relevant to our, our sort of time right now. Um, yeah. tech being very, very, very high up there. And then, you know, obviously climate merging with tech. I, I talked to a lot of founders within sort of climate tech and technology coming out of trying to establish sort of climate stability is mm -hmm. <laughs> is big, right? It, it's it's sort of a, a really big economy yeah. that's brewing there. Yeah. And obviously justice is it, it's sort of in this in this middle of everything. It's sort of this foundational layer of America that is you know, not talked about a lot. And what it is, it's, it, it's divisive, but it's, it, it's not as divisive, because I think people just, they don't, they don't really care as much. And you know, I think it's not a topic that people like to discuss at all. It's, yeah, it's sort of a cause that is, it's one of the most important, but I think it's, it's not given as much light as it possibly could. But there's tons of companies and organizations doing great work here. But I guess talk about the three pillars and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll touch on each one of them a little bit. Sure. I know. I saw you had some great guests in the climate space, which was fantastic. I think it's super important right now. So at dream.org, we really are thinking about how do we come together to solve problems, big problems. And we have a hypothesis. In fact, it's the only thing that's worked is that you can solve some of our world's greatest challenges by being radically inclusive. It goes back to little girl Nisha, who does Love not it. want anyone to be excluded, wants to make sure everything works for everybody. And one of the things we talk about here, it's not just the diversity you like, or the diversity you welcome, or it's not just for my location, where if I come up with a Bay Area climate solution, it's going to be about fires and drought mm -hmm. and electric vehicles. That, sure, that's the front line here. But that ignores talking to farmers in middle America who are also mm -hmm. at the front line of climate change. What do they want yeah. in a climate solution? So for us, we want to have the biggest table possible together so that we don't exclude or leave anyone out or anyone behind in whatever the future we're creating is. And so we took the biggest problem sets that we could think of and put that mentality 
that can you make change by being radically inclusive and making sure equity is up front? Yeah. Can we do that in criminal justice reform? Can we do it in climate? Can we do it in tech equity? And started trying it out. Hmm. For us, the mission you'll see if you look in the website, it says, let's close prison doors and open doors of opportunity. And in closing prison doors, I think you're right. It's something that not a lot of people want to talk about or acknowledge. But when I try to talk about human rights abuses abroad or human rights abuses that you might be familiar with that are happening here, mm -hmm. you have to talk about the criminal justice system. We have only 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's prisoners. Crazy. That's bananas. You know that there is something wrong. And the rates, when you look at the racial implications of who's inside prison and for what, it becomes astounding. Women are the fastest growing population in prison. Bananas. And our system is not meant for rehabilitation or reentry or any type of redemption. And that breaks my heart. And a mm -hmm. lot of other people can't stand to look at it and how horrific it is. So for me, that was criminal justice reform has to be a key piece of opportunity because we are locking up such a huge percentage of our population, our citizens. These are our people, fathers, brothers, sisters, mothers that are inside in order to open doors of opportunity, because I believe our future, especially when we're looking at climate and we're looking at any of the tech solutions that are coming, we need those voices of those who've been locked out or locked up or left behind to lead it. And so we're also very interested in the climate tech space and the justice tech space. Mm -hmm. And we want to bring together very unlikely allies. Again, that's our whole big table approach. Yeah. How can we have community voices from the front lines of climate change in the same room with these tech entrepreneurs who are thinking of sustainability tech that's going to hopefully save our planet? Those folks need to be listening to each other exactly the same way activists and the strategy folks for any social change need, need to be talking to each other. And so we try to foster that, bring those groups together to influence policy and legislation and also influence solutions. So our climate team right now is really working hard on those IRA dollars, $369 billion mm -hmm. for that infrastructure inflation reduction act that will go into climate solutions. How do we make sure that money gets into the right places on stuff that's going to move the needle? on stuff that's gonna create a future that works for everybody, not just for some. And so our business, our Green Business Council, the founders are seven CEOs that are black from green tech companies. How did they get in the conversation? Because the solutions they come up with work for a larger group of the population than the big companies, yeah. been, right? And so we're trying to influence both policymakers and business leaders in that space. And we just launched if you go to dream.org, you can find it. Our launch pad for tech, for climate tech. Saw that. Um, it is Love run it. kind of like an accelerator program or an incubator. And we partner with Village Capital. So again, oh, they're great. Yeah, they're great. They've been doing great stuff. We last year did a partnership with them in the justice tech space, which is even mm -hmm. a smaller, smaller sector. The idea that our criminal justice system, the way we incarcerate people is bananas. The technology we currently use is dungeons. That's the technology yeah. right now. It's Obviously, brutal. there is a better tech solution out yeah. there. Even if you can't win the argument, let's incarcer let's cut the population in half. Yeah. We can say we could at least do it smarter. And yeah. so we partnered with Village Capital last year and launched a justice tech incubator with ten, 10 companies going through it. And then we invested in three of them. Amazing. We are now doing the Justice Innovation Prize, which is a million dollar prize. We had around 300 applicants that were viable applicants. We're narrowing it that down to the top 10. And those 10 are going to present in the fall. And three of them are going to get huge investment from dream.org to build that justice tech sector. And That's so we cool. really do believe tech has the power to be big, scalable thinking at these big problems. But the underlining thing we do at dream.org is prove to people you don't have to increase polarization. You don't have to yeah. hate. You don't have to divide to solve big problems. And that's how I'll know I'll be successful in the future is if through doing these things that move the needle, we also show we can save our democracy and heal humanity, you know, little goals like that. I love this. Do, do uh, Will the cohorts be annual? Has that been going on for a few years, like sort of the I, incubator type style? We need to fundraise for it, for it to be yep. annual. So ideally these ones will make a big enough splash that other folks will want to be invested in it. That's my hope. Sure. So, yeah. No, I love that. I love that idea and that 
that strategy because I think that is that gets people involved that normally might you know just just go to normal normal avenues to get funding right but they might not be ready for funding they, they you know and then they they may be quitting their idea because they they didn't get raised that early weren't ready for it so having these opportunities to like get yourself prepared to get funding i wanted to touch on one thing in justice and, and we talk about you know going across sort of where party lines or philosophical you know lines or, or just you know people that don't are not on the same side as you have you spoken to private prisons have they been involved in conversations at all because Obviously, they are sort of a, a gorilla in the room here that it's a touchy subject and it can, you could can go down a bunch of different ways about it, right? But is there any possibility to get them involved in, in some way in, I mean, in sort of these initiatives? Up, yeah, you <laughs> opened up a really, you know, third rail issue here. Um, <laughs> look, if you talk to anybody on the left or who's been involved in criminal justice reform, I'm pretty sure outside of our group and maybe a few others, if you say the word private prisons, it is a dirty word because what we've yeah. seen, and I think the best example of this is on the border. When you look at the detention centers and those are private prisons where kids are dying, people are dying, you see the videos and it is disgusting and horrible. Those conditions are terrible. And if that's what you look at when you think private prison, you're going to not want to have anything to do with right. it. And I would agree. I think that's terrible. I think it's, but... I'm going to tell anyone that wants to send me hate mail after this, because that's what happens when you open up private prisons, <laughs> that I do think that public prisons are horrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so private prisons are horrible, but so are the public prisons. The incentive yeah. is completely backwards for both. Private yeah. prisons, they're like, oh, I don't want them to monetize on locking people up. Public prisons do the same thing. Same with yep. public schools. They get a dollar. Like public schools get their money on how many kids are there in the morning that sign the roll. Mm -hmm. So send your kid in the morning, they get paid. If they're not there, they get money. They don't get their full budget. It's bizarre. In prisons, you get money per head that's inside. So what's the incentive to send people home? What's the like? What's the incentive yeah. to rehabilitate them? They actually are running off of the guarantee that a lot of these people will recidivate and will come yep. back into prison. So the incentive in public prisons yep. is bad. So yep. that's the first thing I want to tell people. Yes, I can agree. Private's bad. Public is bad too. Yep. No, there I'm are totally good right. programs on in both. And yep. that's what we need to look at is where are the best ideas? Where are they coming from? And make that completely agnostic, whether it's private or public and start bringing those ideas out. Both systems have to transform. I do think just as charter schools have good and bad in terms of how do you get schools to be better, it's going to be very similar with private prisons. There could be some out there. I would like to figure out how to make the incentive be exactly. if you get people yep. rehabilitated. If they don't recidivate, if they have these outcomes, that's how you get money. That yep. would be a great system. And figuring yep. out how to incentivize that is really behind some of our thinking in starting this justice tech sector is yep. I do not think public opinion is anywhere where we can forge that yet. I want to get there as soon as we can. And I think talking about the justice tech field, when you find solutions that are tech enabled and tech forward, that can help get better outcomes inside prison. I think the public private question will become less. It'll be like, what's a great rehabilitation center, whether it's public yep. or private. Yep. So yep. have them all compete for government dollars and be like, the yeah, only listen, I, yeah, private, usually the private sector does pretty much everything better than the public sector as far as like operating certain things and, and, getting things done but that's because the incentives are are there right and with prisons the incentives are based on like if it was a normal startup right they look at the same the same analytics and they look at the same numbers and private prisons are public traded on the stock exchange like maybe that shouldn't happen if the incentives are to just get more people right in prison right and i want private prisons to succeed because i want them to be the reason that Look, we're always going to have people that commit crimes, right? It's just right. A human nature like this, right? But the idea that people are in prison for such a long time for nonviolent crimes, that's over half of the half of our people in prisons are nonviolent offenders. To yeah. me, that's so awful that they have to be on the same pedestal as people who commit yeah. terribly violent crime. That is, but the nonviolent stuff, the, the addiction part, like that is so different. Um, right. and, and to, to profit off that in a really nasty way and where the incentives are, they are right. It's, it's sort of American culture and nature to just go for money, right? Like 
it's not necessarily their fault. It's just the system. But if the yeah. system changes, they will change. If the incentives this, yeah. are different, they will change. Absolutely. So, this is an industry ripe for disruption. Yeah. And who likes to totally. disrupt it? Silicon Valley. So I yep. feel like there is this moment where we can look at, I mean, this is a very corrupt industry. We talked about the incentives being bad. What people are, mental health and drug offenses, like you said, like, why are they even inside prison? Mm -hmm. But the system also, how it classifies violent crime. So often we mm -hmm. think violent, rape, murder, mm -hmm. we don't want mm -hmm. these folks out. Yep. If you happen to be in the house where a violent crime mm -hmm. committed, you could get charged with a violent crime. So I do think the way what we categorize as violent crimes has to be talked about as well. Um, you have, as you know, women for killing their abuser. They are a violent criminal. Mm. And so if you won't even talk about violent crimes, you're also not doing a, you know, a great disservice. Fair. Yeah. You're not doing great service to that too. So the whole industry, the whole thing is ready for disruption, all of it. I think we can do that. We do just wanna... need the rest of the world to catch up. And we need for <laughs> folks to think of not just return on investment being monetary, because you're not going to get, I think you could get great returns. Like in some states, it's like 70 or $80,000 a year to lock up one person. And in those states, I promise you, if you give me $80,000 a year on right. one human, that person yeah. will be rehabilitated no matter what right. their crime is. Yeah. I'm no. positive I can You're figure totally that right. out. Right? Yeah. So the I ROI is for the taxpayer who doesn't have to, to pay that much. And that's where Republicans have been phenomenal allies. They don't want their tax dollars going to a system that doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. Um, do you want to maybe shout out some of the if you if you've seen some of the things that come through come through the not necessarily the cohort, but just maybe that have applied and have sort of done some interesting work early on? Like, do you want to maybe shout out some some work that's being done? in sort of justice tech that, that might give us an idea of what's what's happening, maybe what's coming down the road? Yeah, I think you can look at our site. I can't tell you about the new companies that are sure, in sure. the pipeline for the big competition, but the last 10 are on the Village Capital website. And I was fascinated by this one. I mean, there are all sorts of things. A lot of them sure. were geared in this cohort about reentry, how to make life successful when you come home, um, whether it's how to get credit cards for people who've had these convictions. I didn't know that was an area mm. that was quite hard, but it's very hard to build up that credit and get a credit card. Obviously, if you've been locked away for 20 yeah. years, if you yeah. have credit. But one of them that was interesting is just it's a lot of times you are eligible to get your record clear, but nobody can do it because it costs a ton of money to get a lawyer really? to actually clear it. Okay. And so they put together this technology that if you're eligible and you apply, it's much smaller cost and it's all employed by people who are formerly incarcerated that will get all of it expunged for you. Like that's a very simple tech solution. Yeah cuts out huge lawyer fees because it's yep. very simple and streamlined. You put in your information, they'll, you know, you know, when you're up for um, eligibility for that and just get it done. And then all of a sudden you don't have to check the box anymore. You can apply for a lot of jobs like the box. Are you a felon or not? Right. Sure. Those kind of things become so much easier. Right. Yep. A lot of folks are eligible to vote and don't know it and they can't because they haven't done this because it's way too costly and prohibitively costly. So that was one of the solutions that was just like, oh, that's yeah, huge. that's yeah. yeah. But nobody in Silicon Valley is going to think of building that app because they haven't. I mean, sure, some of them have been incarcerated, but you have to have that lived experience yeah, to know sure. what a huge resource that could be. So wow. I'm very excited yeah. about this field. And I hope as those solutions come about and we tell more people about it, it'll give folks um, more desire to make these changes. That's yeah. Put me in touch with with that. I mean, with with some of these founders, because that would be it'd be really cool to talk to them about what they're building. Because that yeah. this is definitely a sector that you know I haven't tapped into too much. I'll try to end a little bit on the future, and I know we touched on a little bit. I guess as you look three to five years down the line, you know, what are some of the goals and success that you would like to see for Dream.org? Is there is there certain benchmarks that you would like to achieve? I think the cohort idea is amazing. I really hope funding continues to come in for that because I think that is such a, it's such a great idea, a nonprofit doing that. Like mm -hmm. it's so, it's, it's really a special opportunity. So I hope that continues, but I'll let you talk about the, the rest of the yeah, mission I and mean, vision for the future. Just in that entrepreneur cohort sector, what I'd like to see is we then move the policies to enact them. Like, can mm -hmm. we get a public prison in a red state to say, I'm going to take on all of those ideas and we're going to innovate. We're going to see if it can 
you know, do all of these things. So we would then be moving the politics to make that possible. So in three years, mm. I hope that you see bigger experiments in some of the already existing prisons to say, we can get you, you know, more money to do great things, less money mm -hmm. to do if you try out these programs. I'd love yeah, to see those starting to run. So I hope you see that. But honestly, climate is a really important piece of this. We need to see those changes taking place, the money going into the communities. We think anything that's good for the environment should also be a good job. So yep. I hope to see like clean, green tech jobs just growing and especially for the communities that have been left out prior. Yep times for innovation. But really for me, the marker, and we haven't figured out exactly the right measurement for it, is have we decreased polarization? Have we, because we yeah. know polling wise, people want, they don't want to be divided. They want to come together. They just don't think their neighbor does, right? There's this kind mm. of weird perception. And so I'd like to show people that in fact, there are a lot of people out there who want to come together. There are a lot of people who are, they just aren't the loudest ones. They're not getting the attention. I want to show that it's not just possible, but that beautiful, amazing things happen when you take on this mentality, when you take on that common ground approach that all of us have an incentive to make the world a better place, that you can work with folks who disagree with you on 99 things. But if there's one thing you agree on, you can work together. So we actually are trying to figure out what's the right measurement to figure out if we're matching that need. And um, so anyway, anyone who wants to help us figure that out, uh, measuring it now and measuring it then in three years, I'd like to say, yeah, look, by passing this law in this state that did this, we moved yep. the needle a bit on what's possible. Yeah. No, da data will be able to, to help with. I think that's the biggest thing. If we can get build these data sets where it can show us the ROI and what programs are working, like what yields the most value for our community and taxpayers, like that is so obvious. Like we could do, but we could do it. I think we have the founders, we have the tech, we have the data. It's just, you know, funding it, right? Correcting, allocating our current taxpayers' dollars to to invest in this stuff. Yeah. Um, it's there. I think it's going to, yeah. it's in like programs it, like yours. But then it's the messaging of it. How do we make it there. the coolest most totally. beautiful like stuff that yep. hasn't cracked yet because people still <laughs> you know love to just be panicked and upset about whatever whatever so how mm -hmm. do we make it so that that the solutions the possibility that love and unity outpace the fear hate and division we're way out of mark there so there also has to be as each of these victories happen how do we message it so it's more desirable how do we make it the stuff everyone wants to see and that's like it a question that's I don't I, I think I think you kind of hit it actually a little a little earlier in what you just said it's jobs people's ideology will get <laughs> not thrown out the window but it will get adjusted a little bit when you get a high paying job in a community that needs it yeah guess what people who don't believe in sustainable energy you give them a high paying job that is building sustainable energies whether it's solar panels or whether it's lithium batteries for electric vehicles and you pay them double what they're paying that they are making now, guess what? They're going to take the job and they're going to believe in sustainable energy and yeah. vice versa. Whatever, whatever category you want to choose on whatever aisle, it's always going to be jobs. And like I say, I like to say more careers. Yeah. <laughs> if, yes. if that, if that happens, you will start to see a shift in, in ideology because it, it, that's just how we, that's just how we look at things. It's all about, it's all about jobs and careers. If we Pocket can yeah. fund the fund, correct opportunities, whether it's rural America, where it's jobs have been displaced and sent, you know, to, to Asia mm -hmm. or urban America, where the jobs have just never quite been there. Mm -hmm. If we can implement the things that you're talking about and have the Silicon Valleys in many Silicon Valleys in urban cities and in parts of rural America, I think we'll, we'll get that polarization, you know, a lot, yeah. it'll be a lot less dramatic. We'll always have pockets, but I think it'll be a lot less dramatic um, if we can if we can get those careers where they need to be in those two places. That's what we're counting on at Dream.org. So <laughs> awesome. love that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. It's been an amazing conversation. Keep up your incredible journey. Best of luck for you and the team for, for the next decade. Thank you.